couple things before we start. Um, there are a few people that are asking if you should only be seeing the panelists. And yes, you should only see the panelists. We have a um, Zoom webinar format that we're using. Um, so if you see people drop off the screen, it's on purpose. We don't want to have, um, we did it this way intentionally. Um, there are, we are trying to make sure that everyone is on. So um, there might reason why we're, we're starting a little early, um, a little late. Uh, everyone should be muted. Um, if you have any questions uh, for today's um, keynote speaker or panelist, uh, we will be, we'll give you a chance to ask those questions at the end um, of the keynote speech and then after the panel uh, speech. Um, so I'm going to have Dean let um, get things started. Thank you, Simone, and welcome, everybody. On March 25th, 1966, in Chicago at a press conference, Dr. Martin Luther King said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and most inhuman. What we are seeing today with COVID shines a light on health disparities and poor health outcomes experienced by Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. This injustice has been going on for a long time. It's deeply rooted and it is indeed shocking. Uh, and it's even more shocking, I think, as, as we work through this pandemic to see the number of deaths and, and long-term illnesses experienced by very vulnerable populations. So I wanna congratulate Simone uh, Wango uh, and the, the Journal of Science and Technology for picking a topic that could not be more timely or more important and for gathering together this incredible panel of experts, all of, of whom I've, I've met um, in various capacities. And I, I love uh, having you all here uh, today to share your wisdom and thank you for your time. And I'm sure our audience does as well. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll go back to Simone uh, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Dean Um Good afternoon, everyone. Um, especially our speakers, faculty, alumnus, students, and staff. Um, thank you all for joining us today to discuss one of our, the most pressing issues facing our nation and our world today, which is COVID. <laughs> I'm sure many of you, as well as me, are very weary of this uncertainty surrounding COVID, um, especially with in increased infection rates and economic uncertainty that's happening right now and also the looming distraction of whether, of the outcome of our election. Um, however, as we continue to live in this new reality, um, the present is the best time to explore the systemic challenges that COVID has exposed so that we can better understand these challenges and design effective strategies to meet them. Earlier this year, many of us looked on with horror as George Floyd was murdered by um, an unarmed black man was murdered by police officers. While we're facing a global reckoning with health, with a health crisis, we're also facing a reckoning with race relations um, in our nation. Police violence is not the only way that communities of color experience racial injustice. Mr. Floyd was not only subject, subjected to police violence, but he also contracted COVID earlier this year. Mr. Floyd was among the disproportionate number of African Americans, Indigenous Americans, Latinx, and other people of color to contract COVID. Many of those infected had died, have died at astonishingly higher rates than other groups. The COVID health crisis is squarely at the intersection of racial equity and has exposed the disparities in health outcomes for communities of color. That is why we are here today to discuss the intersection between COVID, race, technology, and the law. So I'd like to start off today's symposium by introducing our keynote speaker, Maria Melendez. Maria Melendez is Sidley Austin LLP's Chief Diversity Officer. As Chief Diversity Officer, she leads Sidley's efforts to further advance and increase diversity and inclusion 
across the firm's 20 global offices and within the legal profession as a whole. Moyer, together with eight other full-time diversity and inclusion professionals, works closely with the firm's management and executive committees and two partner-led diversity-related committees. Uh, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee and the Committee on Retention and Pro Promotion of Women. Together, this core group in partnership with other firm leadership and our and lawyers worked to strengthen and advance the firm's diversity and inclusion goals. A frequent speaker on issues surrounding equity and fairness, Maria is dedicated to bolstering the framework on, of policy and practices that have advanced civic recognition as a top law, law firm for women and lawyers of diverse backgrounds. She is a member of the Association of Law Firm Diversity Professionals and proudly serves on the board of the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, Latino Justice, PRLDEF, and the advisory board of the Institute for Inclusion in the Legal Profession. Peers and business leaders have recognized Maria throughout her legal career as a steadfast champion of diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. Maria is a recipient of the Latino Justice PRLDEF 2020 Latino Trailblazer Award. She was appointed to serve on the Multicultural Advancement Advisory Council of Syracuse University in 2019. A year earlier, she was honored with the Puerto Rican Bar Association's Florida Mama Award given to trailblazing women who demonstrate leadership in their field, who are role models to other women and girls and who advance, advocate for equity in, in society. Maria is a recipient of the Council of Urban Professionals Cup Catalyst Change Agent Law Award, which recognizes outstanding leaders in the legal sector who have had a significant impact on their community through nonprofit or public sector service, mentorship and philanthropy. She's also received the Albany Law School Kate Stillman, Stillman Award in recognition of her outstanding contributions to ensuring equity and fairness for women in the legal profession, as well as the Women's City Club of New York Civic Spirit Award. Prior to becoming Sidley's Chief Diversity Officer, Maria was a partner in Sidley's commercial litigation and dispute practice and has more than 25 years of experience in the litigation and arbitration of high stakes commercial disputes, <laughs> representing global clients in state and federal courts throughout the United States and before arbitral tribunals. Over the years, strong leadership and success in representing clients have earned her acknowledgement from various industry groups, including being named one of the top 250 women in litigation by benchmark litigation from 2017 through 2019. She was also elected as a member of the American Law Institute in 2019, and she proudly is a graduate of Albany Law School. So without further ado, I welcome Maria Melendez. Thank you, Simone. That was, uh, as I'm thinking, who are you talking about there? <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you, Dean Olet and, and the entire Albany Law School community for allowing me to share the next few minutes with you on what is, as has been said, an incredibly important topic um, and one that's pretty heavy. Uh, and, and, and I hope that um, I will do it justice in the time that we have. Uh, and with that, let's just uh, get started and forgive me if I have some uh, uh, challenges myself with technology. It is not among the things that Simone listed as my uh, strong suits, but let's see, let's see how we do here. Um, okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Terrific, okay. Someone can, uh, can yell if, if, you, if you're not able to see my screen. Um, okay, thank you again for, for the opportunity to join you today. I thought I would start with just uh, level setting where we are in terms of the impact of the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic in, in the United States. As of yesterday, these are the most recent statistics, 9.2 cases uh, and over 20, uh, 230,000 deaths. As Simone mentioned in her remarks, it is in fact the case that uh, COVID has disproportionately impacted uh, communities of color. 
Um, these statistics that are uh, on the screen are as of August of this past year, and um, I was not able to find the most recent uh, statistics, but I venture to guess that they have remained either about the same levels or have uh, unfortunately become worse. Uh, <clears throat> As of a couple of weeks ago, these are the most recent mortality rates uh, that are available. And as you will see, it is in fact the case that um, people of color and indigenous uh, Americans are disproportionately affected, not only in the number of cases, but also in the, in the number of uh, deaths. So what's accounting for uh, some of this disparity? As best as we can tell through the current uh, research and statistics, a lot of the disparity has to do with um, socioeconomic status. Uh, most Black and Hispanic Latinx um, uh, victims of COVID are, tend to be folks who are frontline essential workers. Uh, they tend to be folks who um, are in hospital hospitality uh, the hospitality industry. Uh, they tend to be folks who do not have the option of working from home. Um, and they also tend to be folks who have either um, little to no healthcare uh, insurance and little to no opportunities through their work to take time off when they're sick. So unfortunately, um, folks who may not be feeling well um, and, and because of socioeconomic reasons feel that they cannot afford not to go to work uh, or for other reasons, um, they tend to be uh, among those that are most impacted by COVID as a result, again, of their socioeconomic situation. Pre-existing health conditions also seems to be much more prevalent among the um, black and brown communities in the United States. Um, and as a result, you have a greater uh, risk of death if you are uh, black or Hispanic or of other um, uh, ethnic, racial and ethnic background than our white uh, Americans to succumb to this disease. The environmental conditions in many of the neighborhoods where um, minority communities live is also uh, has been identified as a key contributor to the disproportionate impact that COVID is having on communities of color. Um, and similarly, housing situations, um, again, mostly in the urban communities where um, Black and Hispanic and other um, communities of color live are uh, either in uh, situations that are uh, densely populated, so they do projects, um, or you are living in, particularly in the Hispanic Latino community, you are, um, for familiar reasons, you're living with not only your immediate family, but extended family members as well. So you have a lot of people living in the same household um, and, and as a result, the likelihood, again, of being exposed to COVID is significantly greater in those communities. We have also seen, um, in addition to the health impact of the disease uh, on communities of color, there's also been a disproportionate impact uh, from the economics perspective as well. There's a greater likelihood, for example, that um, the drop in the labor uh, opportunities that has been experienced across the board, regardless of your racial and ethnic background, every American to some extent or another has been impacted by the decrease in the labor market over the last uh, few months. But uh, again, it tends to be the case that um, communities of color have disproportionately been impacted by lost job opportunities, wage opportunities. Um, and Black women um, among the uh, communities of color in particular have been uh, negatively impacted by the current employment situation. The unemployment rate, uh, which is, uh, you see some of the statistics on the current slide on the right side, um, has really been fairly steady since um, uh, June, uh, among the Black community in April, you had an unemployment rate that reached as high as 16%. That has begun to come down a bit. Uh, in May, it was, uh, May stayed steady around 16%. In June, it, it dropped to 14%. Uh, 
Um, again, we don't have the current um, statistics. I don't have the current statistics for the last couple of months, but my, my sense from what I've seen is that it is continuing to uh, at least hover around the mid-teen mark for the Black uh, Americans. Um, Hispanic uh, Latinx Americans, similar story. You started around 16, 17% for the Latino community back in, in April, and it has steadily begun to decline or improve, I should say. So in May, it was about 15%. As of June, is around 13%. Again, hovering around the mid-teen mark for the Latino community. Um, the white community uh, started again in April um, around the 14, 15% unemployment has begun to get better over the last couple of months, uh, went down to 12% in May, and uh, it's around 10% in June. And again, hovering around that nine, 10% um, at the moment. Now, why is it that uh, we believe that black and Hispanic and Latinx communities are experiencing more hardships from the economic losses that are attributable to the pandemic. Um, again, some of the job losses that have uh, uh, devastated the Latinx community, uh, mostly due to the higher poverty rates, you have lower income communities, you have lower employment rates uh, among the Latino population, among the Black population that is different from the uh, white uh, Americans. And, and that accounts for, uh, for some of the economic disparity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Latinos, Hispanics, Blacks tend to be more uh, in terms of their, um, in the urban communities tend to be, their employment tends to be more in the um, either frontline workers. So your nurses, your bus drivers, your train operators, um, et cetera. And also in the hospitality field. So you have, uh, again, uh, restaurants, hotels, um, uh, maintenance, and, and those are all um, jobs that, again, you can't do from home. Uh, so you are necessarily, uh, if you are going to remain employed, you need to be out in the public and as a result, exposing yourself to the virus to a greater degree than perhaps others who are able to work from home. The undocumented immigrant population is also one that um, has been particularly devastated by uh, the pandemic because in addition to all of the things we've talked about with respect to the impact on Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans as well, by the way, Indigenous uh, uh, Americans, um, the undocumented uh, immigrants have the additional uh, whammy, if you will, of not having access to the various safety, social safety net that um, the federal government has um, provided for others, including, uh, for example, some of the relief that was provided under the CARES Act and other benefits that are available to Americans that are not available to undocumented uh, immigrants. And here uh, on this slide, we're talking about the impact on uh, Black Americans. And, and again, uh, similar to the Latino community, um, here, pre-pandemic, you have Black workers who are less likely to have multiple earner households. So if you have one earner who loses their job because it's no longer a job that they can perform, um, uh, remotely or they can't perform for other reasons, then you have a situation where the household is without a steady income. Uh, you also have the Black community, similar to the Latino community as well, there's a lack of um, savings, financial reserves to help you navigate uh, for a few months of, of uh, delayed or unavailable income. And that together with everything else uh, that has impacted the community, the health costs um, and the like, uh, result in a significant impact to the ability of communities of color to really withstand and be able to uh, get through this pandemic uh, without more assistance, without more support. We've seen in addition to the health and economic uh, impact that has disproportionately um, felt, fallen upon the communities of color in the United States, we also see um, uh, risk of housing 
uh, across the board, as you see on this chart, uh, Asian, Black, Hispanic, and other communities of color are more likely to find themselves in a situation where they cannot make the monthly payments uh, that are due, whether rent or mortgage payments for their housing, or um, have absolutely no expectation that they will be able to afford uh, their rent or mortgage uh, in the near future. So again, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety around uh, not only your health, your, your job, but then also are you going to be able to uh, have a, a roof over your head um, is, is among the, the, the stressors that are impacting in a disproportionate way the communities of color. The other really, um, to my uh, mind at least, uh, one of the most unfortunate and, and um, impacts that are likely to have a significant long-term effect on the um, communities of color is the lack of access to education. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the reports were telling us that there are about 15 million school-aged children that do not have access to broadband, uh, broadband access or um, electronic devices. So you talk about technology uh, and the lack of access to technology for approximately 15 million school-aged children. That is a significant impact on our future. Um, Nine million students uh, lacked both connectivity and internet enabled devices. And again, these 9 million students are primarily, although not exclusively, uh, students in the communities of color across the country. A recent McKenzie study found that the educational achievement gap has widened for black students by 15 to 20% since the onset of the school closures back in the spring of this year. Um, I, I am deathly uh, afraid of what the statistic is gonna show once the results and the um, data is analyzed for the period beginning in the fall of this year through the end of, of the coming school year. I, I unfortunately fear that this is gonna become an even wider gap for uh, black students and Hispanic students and other communities of color in, in this country. Um, another interesting uh, statistics coming out of this study, uh, two, two interesting statistics. Uh, one, uh, the prediction that the loss, the education loss for K through 12 students um, as a result of the remote work, uh, remote learning environment, is gonna be about six, seven months. So schools, uh, students through in the K through 12 uh, category are expected or predicted to fall behind in terms of the educational growth and progress by approximately seven months. Um, black students may fall behind by 10 to three months, Latinx students nine to 12 months, nine to two, 9.2 months, excuse me. And low income students more than a year. Again, I worry about this because it tells me that we're going to have a significant delay in, in the educational progress of students of color in this country. The disruption, of course, of not being able to go to school and not being able to have access to after school activities, to extra, extracurricular activities, um, to uh, the teachers and coaches and tutors that were available to students in the normal course and are no longer available as a result of this remote environment and, and everything else that has resulted in the closure of, of many of these uh, activities is also, again, gonna be something that, I, that worries me, that makes me feel that um, we're gonna have a, a, a potentially at least a generation of students who um, did not have that kind of access, uh, which is so critical um, to the, mentorship to sponsorship to the development of uh, societal skills, social skills that you have when you interact with uh, adults uh, other than the adults in your immediate family. So again, something to keep an eye out for because it does, um, does not, um, to my mind at least, seem like something that will be um, a positive going forward. And again, that's, this is something that impacts all of our kids, not just communities of color, but um, it's something that I worry about. Now, as a, as a practicing lawyer and, uh, and now the chief diversity officer for Sidley Austin, uh, I look at these trends and, I, and I, I, I think about 
the, the future, the immediate future at least, and how uh, based on the experts, unfortunately, we're, it's, it's probably the case that we will not be back to anything remotely co close to quote unquote normal until at least next Next year. So we're thinking, you know, it's looking like maybe next summer, maybe next fall before things get back to quote unquote normal. Um, who knows what the world is going to look like at that point. Um, but based on these, um, what we've seen in the last few months and what we anticipate to be happening over the course of the next few months, I fear uh, that there would be a significant, there will be a significant delay uh, when it comes to the development and, and continuing increase of the pipeline of students of color that graduate from high school that go to college and then enter the legal, go to law school and into the legal profession. Um, already the population of uh, students of color in the legal, in the law, law school and legal profession is relatively small. Um, based on statistics from last year, generally speaking, the percentage of students of color at law schools across the country range, depending on the school from 17 to 34%. Obviously, they're, they're much higher at uh, HBCUs, uh, but generally, uh, outside of HBCUs, you're talking about a population of uh, students of color in that 17 to 34% range. Um, when it comes to Black and Hispanic students, those numbers tend to float more from 3%, depending on the school again, to 9%, 10% at most, again, outside of HBCUs. Looking at just the statistics for, for Albany Law School uh, for this year, as, as an example, again, the, at my understanding, the average of students of color at the school in 2020 is about 23%. Black students, 5%, Hispanic students, 8%, eight, uh, Asian students, 4%. So, so again, the, the current existing pipeline before you have the added um, uh, costs of, of the pandemic, uh, was was precious. It was a precious small number that we were all, all of us who are in this uh, field of diversity and inclusion and legal profession and advancing diversity and inclusion in the legal profession have been concerned about, um, and now more so because, uh, again, if you have a declining pipeline of students going to college, going to law school, is going to necessarily impact these numbers. And the reason why this is so critical, uh, also consider the fact that Overall, the profession, uh, lawyers of color in the legal profession uh, continues to be challenged. Um, the statistics tell us, uh, based on 2019 NALP information, for example, um, last year the, the law firms that were studied, over a thousand, or approximately a thousand law firms submitted their um, statistics to NALP. And you have across the country, uh, aggregate number of small law firms, large law firms, big law firms, you have approximately 46, 47,000 partners across the country, across law firms. And of those partners, uh, you have only 24% of women, 10% uh, of people of color, 3% uh, are women of color. So at the firm leadership levels across the country, the, the percentage of, of um, lawyers of of color is, is, remains very low. Um, and uh, among associates, you have, uh, again, across the, the, the country, approximately a thousand law firms reporting their data. You have 45,000, almost 46,000 associates. Of those associates, 47% of women, 25% of people of color, lawyers of color, and 14% are women of color lawyers. So again, the statistics are uh, are not uh, particularly robust right now. And the fear of having more uh, uh, stress on the pipeline, going to law school and eventually joining law firms, joining corporate law departments, going to the judiciary, going to academia, um, it is a concern. So what can we do about this? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, uh, an issue that we all have to come together and, 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 and try to come up with solutions. We've seen in some of the data, some of the literature, there's some ideas floating around about uh, federalized subsidized housing, uh, finding ways to provide Wi-Fi, um, better internet access to the communities that are lacking 
um, making laptops available, making um, desktops available, making smartphones, uh, tablets available to students who cannot afford them uh, is, is something that is, is being discussed. And in some school districts, they are being provided to students who cannot afford them. Um, there is discussion around uh, having schools partner more with nonprofits, organizations that can provide social support. Um, and can expand technology opportunities for their uh, constituents. Um, and so those are, those are some of the things that are, that are happening uh, or, or being discussed across the country. I think there should be more, I'm, and I'm sure there is more, uh, but they're just some of the things that, um, that uh, Americans and, uh, are, are coming together to try to solve this, this issue. A lot of challenges remain. There's a lot of um, politics, unfortunately, involved in this, and, and hopefully, we will be able to um, come together and, and, and adopt real solutions. One of the things that I, um, I wanted to share, a thought that I wanted to share with you all this afternoon for, for further uh, discussion and consideration by others who are expert, more expert than I on this, is the question of whether or not um, there is a constitutional right to literacy. Right. Because as I look at the data, as I hear the stories, as I reflect on um, the antidotes that I, I see and hear, um, the lack of technology, the lack of access to technology uh, for students, uh, regardless of their background, to my mind, is effectively a lack of access to literacy, potentially. And so the question is that I pose this to you all, um, is there a constitutional right to literacy? Because if there is, it does the lack of access to technology result or infringe on your right to literacy. Um, to help kick this conversation off for uh, a little bit, I wanted to share with you, the Supreme Court of the United States has um, effectively ruled that there is no fundamental right to education. Um, but it has also, in various different um, cases, expressed a understanding and highlighted the importance of education in this country. Um, just think of a decision like Brown versus Board of Education as an example. And here I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm highlighting for you uh, a decision, a uh, Supreme Court decision in 1982, where the court invalidated a Texas statute that completely deprived children of an education reasoning that the total deprivation would place an insurmountable burden on children. And in discussing this uh, burden, the court emphasized the fundamental nature and importance of basic literacy, literacy skills and the troubling consequences that flow from depriving students, children of those skills. And, and I'm gonna read the quote here from the decision, um, quote, the inability to read and write will handicap the individual deprived of a basic education each and every day of his life. The inestimable toll of that deprivation on the social, economic, intellectual, and psychological well-being of the individual and the obstacle it poses to individual achievement make it most difficult to reconcile the cost of the principle of a status-based denial of basic education with the framework of equality embodied in the Equal Protection Clause. Depriving access to literacy also, uh, as that decision uh, points out and, and others, impacts other constitutional rights. The Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment guarantees certain protections so that individuals can, for example, uh, in light of yesterday's uh, events, uh, you can access the justice system. You can uh, ex exercise your right to vote. Um, these are all important constitutional rights that the courts have repeatedly, the Supreme Court has repeatedly um, underscored and emphasized the importance of, all of which are tied to, to one degree or another, um, access to education and the importance of education. In this country, as of at least uh, last week, uh, no decision has held, no court had, no Supreme Court decision has held that there is a fundamental right to the access, uh, fundamental right to access to literacy. There was in, in the spring of this year, a Sixth Circuit decision, um, Gary B versus Gretchen, Gretchen Whitmer, um, that held exactly that. 
this decision for the first case, again, that I'm aware of uh, to hold that there is a constitutional right to a basic minimum education guaranteeing access to literacy. And this decision, by the way, um, in full disclosure, is a case that Sibley Austin, my colleagues uh, at Sibley Austin, um, represented the plaintiffs in the case uh, here. And, and the plaintiffs were a, uh, a number of school children from the Detroit, uh, three or four or five school districts in Detroit, um, mostly minority children, low income communities. And what the court ruled there, uh, you had a situation where there was a fundamental lack of access to education. There were no teachers, they were unqualified teachers, there were facilities that were absolutely deplorable, um, mice, rats, no books, no, um, no computers, uh, no heat, um, no drinkable water. I mean, the circumstances in these school districts were just, you know, third world uh, uh, circumstances and in any event, uh, the, the court here, uh, Sixth Circuit, found against the uh, a number of Michigan state officials, including the governor, and did in fact find that the right to a basic minimum education, access to literacy, is so deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition as to meet the historical prong of the Supreme Court's substantive due process test. The court went on to say, and it was an important uh, point that I want to emphasize for you here as you all consider whether or not this is something worth looking further into. Um, the court said every meaningful interaction between a citizen and the state is predicated on a minimum level of literacy, meaning that access to literacy is necessary to access our political process. Those are the words of the uh, Judge Clay who wrote the majority opinion and Judge Jane Straunch, which uh, also uh, um, submitted a uh, concurring uh, opinion, went on to say the unique role of public education as a source of opportunity, separate from the means of a child's parent, parents creates a heightened social burden to provide at least a minimal education. Thus, the exclusion of a child from a meaningful education by no fault of her own should be viewed as especially suspect. So that was a significant decision. Now, this decision was rendered in April of 2020. After this decision, the parties did settle. They reached a settlement. Um, and the settlement included a number of, of, of commitments by, by the state of Michigan, uh, including funding and, and seeking uh, the funding for uh, up to $94 million for more literacy related programs and initiatives for school children affected by, um, the, by, by the decision. There were other commitments, including the establishment of a task force to monitor and um, oversee the progress that, um, that, the, that the school districts and the, and the state were supposed to implement for, for the children of Detroit. Following that um, um, uh, settlement, uh, the, um, there was a, uh, an appeal that was pending. Uh, and after the settlement, the Sixth Circuit also um, voted to hold an en banc review of the court's decision that held, holding that there was a constitutional right to literacy. And, and by doing so effectively, what the Sixth Circuit did by rule was to vacate the previous decision. So um, the decision finding for the first time in any decision that I'm aware of, again, that there is a constitutional right to a basic education, that decision by the Sixth Circuit was as a result of the en banc review uh, stricken and it's not, it's not uh, precedent. But I raise this decision with you, uh, I share it with you, because again, as we think about um, the impact of COVID on communities of color, the, the, the fact that we're likely to be in a remote work environment, remote schooling environment for the foreseeable future. And for those students across the country um, that do not have adequate access to technology that they will need in order to continue to have meaningful access to education, meaningful access to literacy, um, I submit to you that this is worth considering and worth exploring. And perhaps there are uh, organizations or groups that are already doing so. But again, um, in the context of the conversation that we're having today, I thought I would raise it for the group's consideration. Now let's talk a little bit about what has been the, the broader impact of COVID-19 on the future of the legal profession. Um, 
Well, so far, I think uh, the answer is, is too soon to tell. For the most part, at least on the, on the uh, litigation side, on the uh, judicial side, you have seen the ability of parties and, uh, and judges and courts to adapt to these uh, current environments. So you have um, oral arguments being held remotely. You have trials and arbitral proceedings being held remotely, which I'm sure those of us who litigated uh, prior to this time uh, never thought would be possible. Um, I remember probably 10, 15 years ago, I had a case in the Central District of um, California and the, the judge appeared by a, a television camera. And it was, I don't remember exactly what the circumstances was, but it was, it was such a bizarre and unusual experience. And I thought to myself, well, geez, this, is, this will never happen again. Um, and sure enough, here we are 10, 15 years later. And it seemingly at this point, everyone is, um, everyone in, in the legal profession, I should say, that is able to, is in fact, uh, practicing law remotely. And as best as I can tell, uh, there are no significant uh, hiccups, uh, other than some people who you've, I'm sure, heard the stories of, of lawyers appearing for court hearings and are not dressed appropriately. I, I heard a, an article or a story a, a month or so ago of a, of a, of a lawyer or counsel who appeared for a court conference and apparently was um, laying on his bed, uh, not wearing appropriate clothing, which very bizarre to me, but um, uh, other than those stories, I think for the most part, uh, things have run uh, pretty smoothly. Depositions, which again, something that people, uh, I would imagine, uh, thought would not happen. Um, uh, courts are saying, yes, under the circumstances, depositions can go forward. Uh, they may not be in person. Trans on the transactional side, also deals are being done. Uh, corporations, uh, judiciary, uh, schools have been able to adapt. Um, and so far, at least, it seems that um, people have been able to figure it out. Now, what, what concerns me? Um, and why do I say that it's too soon to tell? I think that, um, again, the, the, the pandemic circumstances, um, the continued remote work and school circumstances um, have, have brought on a added stress. Uh, and I'm sure all of you who are on this uh, Zoom call this, this afternoon are feeling it as well. Uh, there's, there's Zoom fatigue for sure. Um, there's stress around being able to balance uh, the work that you have for your uh, enterprise. And if you are a working parent, the ability to um, the ability to handle it all, right? So one of the things that worries me is that um, the circumstances, and you're starting to see it already, um, the challenges of trying to balance your current work commitments with commitments, uh, whether they be homeschooling children, um, whether they be um, providing care for elderly parents or other family members, managing all of that without the resources that you would typically have. So for example, if you have nannies or you have daycare centers, you have extracurricular activities that your children would ordinarily be at that would free up your time to do these other things. Um, they're no longer available, at least not at, to the same extent that they have been as a result of the pandemic. And this worries me because unfortunately what I'm seeing and you're seeing it in the literature too, this environment is disproportionately impacting um, women uh, and also uh, communities of color um, where they have tend, tend to have typically more responsibilities um, with extended family members than non-communities of color in, in, in some circumstances. So it worries me, uh, the possibility of losing talent uh, in the legal profession, women who are choosing because of their circumstances to self-select out of employment um, uh, as a means of being able to handle and deal with um, their commitments at home. So uh, with that, uh, I will um, turn it back to Simone. Um, I thank you all so much for the opportunity to, um, to have this conversation and participate in this conversation with you all this afternoon. As I mentioned, it is a heavy topic. 
Um, but we need to have these conversations because otherwise um, progress uh, is not gonna be uh, made and, and we're not gonna be able to help each other in the ways that we all want to. So I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, for your remarks. Um, we really appreciate you um, sharing with us today. I do have one question um, that was posed. Uh, the question is, is COVID's effect the same or different from other illnesses effect on differing demographics? Um, what I think they're asking is, is the impact of COVID, the disproportional impact of COVID the same um, in comparison with other illnesses? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, I think it's fair to say that um, at least by the numbers, right? We've had prior viruses, yes, uh, a couple of years ago during the Obama administration, there were um, other uh, viruses that were circulating around the country and circulated around the world that did have um, and did result in deaths, right? But the numbers were so small in comparison to what we're seeing today. Um, I don't know if they did a similar uh, analysis of the racial and ethnic background of the people that were impacted by those diseases, uh, those viruses back uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, so I can't answer that question. Thank you. Uh, let me just see if there are any other questions. Um, I think this is more of a comment. Okay. Um, th there's another question. How likely are the changes imposed by COVID to last in the legal profession? Um, again, too soon to tell at this point. Um, we, for example, law firms that uh, my law firm and, and others that I'm in contact with, the, the speculation is that, for example, we're, we're right now we're in the middle of recruiting for summer associate 2021 classes, right? Uh, all of us are. And, um, you know, understandably, students are asking, is this going to be an in-person program next summer or is it going to be a remote? And the, the, the honest answer right now is that we don't know. You know, um, it, it, it all depends on, do we have a vaccine? Do we have enough uh, vaccine that's effective? Do we have people uh, taking the vaccine? Uh, you know, there's some speculation that there may be members of the, of the country that, that don't because they don't trust it or whatever other reasons. Um, so I think it's, it's just too soon to tell. We hope that it will be in person, but if I were a betting person, I would probably say that we were gonna be back in a remote environment even still. And even there, um, a lot also depends on where you are in the country, right? Because the, the virus is currently, right now in the Midwest, is, is having some surges. If that changes um, and as it moves around the country, depending again on where you are, some places in person um, work environment will be uh, available, but uh, in other cases not. So again, it's too, too soon to tell at this point. My guess is that it's going to, even if you start going back to work, um, you're seeing a lot of companies and law firms are starting to think about it, um, whether they allow for remote work permanently, right, and give employees an option of working remotely. Um, some of the tech companies have already announced that that is, in fact, going to be the policy for them going forward, regardless of what happens um, with COVID. I don't think law firms are quite there yet. Um, but I think uh, on the positive note, the, the remote work um, environment and the, and the adaptability of law firms and uh, lawyers to the remote environment has resulted in opportunities for there to be more uh, policies allowing for remote work. Typically, it's not something that you see in, in, you know, in large numbers across law firms. There's a fear that productivity wouldn't be the same if you're working remotely. But if, you know, if this experience that we've had for the last seven, eight months has entirely debunked that theory, uh, people are productive, people are able to function and practice law remotely and do so effectively um, and at the highest levels. So 
um, I, I, you know, that's a potential bright spot uh, of having gone through this experience is that there is evidence um, that productivity remotely will not be impacted. Okay. Um, I think it is three o'clock. Um, as you indicated earlier, you had to, um, to leave us now and we did get started a little late. So if we didn't get a chance to get to your questions, um, I apologize. But we, we can um, actually reserve any questions that weren't, weren't answered um, by Maria for our panelists as well. Um, I just want to thank you for joining us. Um, and I really appreciate it. And your talk was very insightful. Yeah, my pleasure. Good luck for the rest of the uh, symposium. And uh, stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. We're just going to take a brief second so that we can get the panelists started. Um, just a quick note, um, our final, our, one of our panelists is in, is having issues with her internet connection. So she, um, she's going to jump on. She's just, um, moving to a location that has a more stable connection. So today's panel will be moderated by Professor Dodds. Professor Dodds earned her BA in African American Studies and Mass Communications from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She went on to earn her JD uh, cum laude from Howard University School of Law. Thereafter, she practiced law in the District of Columbia in Maryland where she specialized in real estate development and corporate law. Professor Dodge joined the faculty of Albany Law in 2019 is an, an, is an assistant professor of law and lawyering. Hey everyone, surprise, it's Professor Dawes in Dean Millett's office. <laughs> Maybe this is symptomatic of 2020. You have no idea how fast I had to drive to get here. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Um, the gravity of today is definitely not lost on me. I think that the irrefutable impact of COVID on communities of color has proven what so many of us has said to be true for such a very long period of time, which is that structural discrimination is one of the most insidious forms of racism. So thank you to all of our panelists. I would like to begin by introducing um, our amazing panelists to, for today. First, I would like to introduce Professor Matthew L. M. Fletcher. Um, Professor Fletcher is the MSU Foundation Professor of Law and Director of Indigenous Law and Policy Center at Michigan State University. He sits as an appellate judge for several tribes. He is a citizen of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. Professor Fletcher is the author of the leading law blog on American Indian law and policy. It's called Turtle Talk. And Professor Fletcher graduated from the University of Michigan law school in 1997 and the University of Michigan in 1994. Welcome to Professor Fletcher. Thank you. Now I'm moving on to David Crossman. David is an Albany Law School class of 2017 graduate. He is a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society of Northeastern New York, where he represents tenants and works with community partners to prevent homelessness in Schenectady County. He is currently a member of the Legal Aid Society's 2020 Priority Setting Committee and is also an employee resource group facilitator, both focused on race and equity. At Albany Law, David was a member of the Journal of Science and Technology and co-director of the 2016 Veterans Rights Pro Bono Project. In 2017, he was a pro bono scholar placed at the Legal Aid Society. Prior to law school, David was an elections administrator for the Vermont Secretary of State and a redistricting clerk for the state of Alaska. He lives in Rensselaer County with his wife, Jane Rudenberg, and their rescue dog, Bam Bam the Destroyer. <laughs> Welcome, David. Thank you, glad to be here. And now I'd like to introduce Professor Seema Mahap Mahapatra. 
Professor Mohapatra is a tenured associate professor of law at Indiana University, Robert H. McKinney School of Law in Indianapolis, Indiana. She has taught a wide variety of courses, including torts, introduction to healthcare law and policy, bioethics and the law, genetics and the law, public health law, law, professional responsibility, and business organizations. Professor Mohapatra is an expert in biotechnology and the law, public health law, reproductive justice, and health equity. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she has written about various issues, including structural racism, mask mandates, and racial discrimination, mask mandates, and disability law, immunity passports, advanced directives, health justice, and online teaching. She is regularly consulted by the media for her expertise. Her scholarship was featured in Vox and the Indy Star. She is the co-editor of Feminist Judgments, Health Law, rewritten with Lindsay F. Wiley, forthcoming in 2021 by Cambridge University Press. She is also a co-author of the forthcoming third edition of the textbook, Reproductive Technologies and the Law, with Judith Dare, um, Glenn Cohen and Sonia Suter, forthcoming 2021 by Carolina Academic Press. Welcome. And can you please correct me if I am mispronouncing your name? I feel no, like I've stumbled over. Patra. It's just all, all the syllables you hear, but I'm, I appreciate you attempting it. So that, good job. <laughs> okay, I have one of those names. So. Yeah, exactly. Thank <laughs> all you. All right. So now we will have a round of questions, um, four rounds of questions, we may get to fewer. And each one of our panelists will have five minutes to answer their question. So I will begin with uh, Professor Mohapatra, if that's okay with you. Uh, the first question that I have is you, what is what is structural discrimination and how does it relate to public health law in this pandemic? First, I want to say thank you so much for having me here, and it's just great that you guys are all focusing on this really important issue right now. And I was kind of, um, ironically, uh, the the first uh, the keynote speaker Maria who talked about internet. I was having issues, so I'm I'm glad that we are here. But um, when so I've written a lot about structural discrimination in general, but during this pandemic. Um, particularly it has kind of laid bare uh, the effects of structural discrimination. And so by structural discrimination, what I'm referring to is the way that laws and policies are used to limit equal access to resources such as safe housing, quality health care, and high wage jobs. And so prior to the pandemic, racial and ethnic minorities, especially of women, women of color, disproportionately suffered from poor health outcomes. And this was due to structural discrimination. And so as a result of these inequities, the same populations are more susceptible to cont contracting, dying from, um, COVID-19 compared to white population. So if we're serious about kind of addressing the problems arising from this pandemic, we have to act to break down the root causes of structural discrimination. So including housing, including education and schooling, including healthcare, uh, employment laws to protect minorities uh, from harm and uh, to provide much needed support. So <clears throat> I've written a few co-authored pieces during this pandemic re related to structural discrimination with Professor Rakaya Yerby, Professor Lindsay Wiley, and Professor Emily Benfer with related to structural discrimination related to housing, employment, and healthcare. I have a new project that I'm working on on progress, um, and it kind of relates very well to the keynote speaker, because it's, it's about how children have been impacted and ignored by this pandemic and kind of what to do about it. And so, you know, there are many stories and hopefully I'll have some time later on to kind of talk about some of the stories about how children have been impacted by the pandemic and how I think a health justice framework can help and the health and kind of explain what the health justice framework is. So I don't want to take up everyone else's time, but I'll, I'll just kind of stop there right now. Thank you so much. And so now I would like to move on to David. So as you just heard, Professor Mahapatra discussed structural discrimination in housing. Um, well, 
a, a little bit so. Uh, you specifically provide legal services to individuals in housing cases. Um, in what ways do you see structural racism in housing cases, and how do your clients experience it? Um, well, just going off the last comment, I think that, that this is an important thing to keep in mind is that the structural piece has, um, we're really, it, it's always existed and this just kind of actually shines a light on it. Um, I was somewhat optimistic when, you know, we first went in March that maybe this would be kind of a reckoning to a whole new way of thinking about things. Um, I'm still somewhat optimistic, um, maybe not quite as optimistic, um, and, and we'll see, um, you know, where my optimism goes in the next few days. Um, I would say, one of the things, two things I would say um, in housing, there's private housing and there's public housing. In my view, um, well, actually, I do need to say, um, I should have led with this. I do need to give the standard disclaimer that these are my opinions and not my employers, um, especially with legal aid um, funding in, in the works. Um, so with that out of the way, um, what I see as, as the real structural um, pieces here in public housing is public housing itself, public housing and subsidies. A lot of people don't realize the restrictions that are on those um, on those subsidies or on the on the housing itself. Um, one of the favorites that I see um, housing authorities um, accuse people of is persons not on lease. Um, basically you have, um, you can have a person stay with you for up to 14 days in a year if you live in public housing and that's it. As you can imagine uh, with things being so uncertain and housing being uncertain right now and um, some people losing income and trying to um, kind of go double up on housing, that could cause an issue right there as well. Um, I will also say the CARES Act that was passed in March, um, there's still a few aspects that are still kind of out there. Um, but when they passed that, they specifically kind of um, exempted, or at least there was a thought from the public housing authorities that there was an exemption for criminal activity or lease violations even. Um, so they could go forward with an eviction based on a lease violation. Um, in private housing, I would say um, generally the systemic things that I see are just the, the poor housing itself, and that becomes a cycle. Um, and, you know, most of our clients, um, most of my clients, because I work on grants, a lot of my clients come under a grant where it's under 30% of the area median income. That's a that's $20,000 for a household of one, but it's 29,000 for a household of four. Um, so when you, when you talk about those income levels, um, most people are, I wanna say living on the margins, but there's really not even any margins there to live on. Um, so any tiny little thing is gonna set um, them behind on rent um, and that could set a cycle of um, having to negotiate a move out date or something and then having to find a, 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 an apartment that might be subpar. So it's kind of a moving from one subpar ap apartment to another. Um, and the other thing that I see um, that frustrates me is everyone knows about warranty of habitability defenses. Um, I do not personally think that the courts um, adequately assess what the defects in an apartment are. For example, there's case law that says that um, an apartment with no heat or hot water would result in about a 30% abatement of rent. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to add to that, that, that takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of effort to prove that even. So, um, you know, that's where we are. And a lot of clients will come in and say, well, this was wrong and this is wrong. And I, I, I understand, but I also have to counsel them that this is, there, are, there are barriers. And there are also some courts that require, um, and, and of course we disagree with this policy. There are some courts that are requiring people to put up a deposit of all the rent that is due and owing before they will hear a warranty of habitability defense. I, I can't believe that's happening. That just is so antithetical to just basic human decency that, yeah, I, I can't believe, well, maybe I can. Stranger, yeah, stranger things are currently happening. Yes. Um, all right, so I would like to move on now to Professor Fletcher. You recently authored an essay entitled Indian Lives Matter, 
in which you discuss how federal courts have allowed non-member claims to prevail over enforcement activities of tribes on Indian reservations and the impact of non-member activity on enforcement lockdowns. Can you talk about the history surrounding court enforcement of non-member activities on Indian reservations and the current impact on the outcomes of COVID? Sure thing, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so uh, I wrote a paper recently and uh, I'll, I'll give you a link to it uh, while I'm talking. So um, the, uh, the issues in Indian country are, are pretty wide and varied. Um, when we talk about structural racism in Indian country, what we're talking about is over the past century, century and a half, the United States has allowed um, non-Indians to enter Indian country, own land, um, take over some aspect of control over what used to be Indian reservations, Indian lands. Um, at the same time, Congress has not authorized tribes to regulate or tax those non-members. So we have the structural problem, uh, a two-pronged structural problem of tribes having uh, large numbers of people on their reservations that they have no little or no jurisdiction over or control over, plus they can't tax them. So there is really no reservation tax base. So when you have a situation that happened this year where uh, tribal economies have to shut down, whether that's natural resource extraction or tourism or gaming revenues, um, or even just the tribal government itself being shut down as a, um, as a bureaucratic entity, it is part of the economy. Um, what you have is a tribe that just no longer has any revenues whatsoever. It's not as if there is a rainy day fund with many tribes, there is no tax base with which to uh, draw from in, in the event of a, a crisis like this. Um, in addition, and really the focus of my paper on the second uh, the paper that you're talking about is the question of what to do with people within the reservation that um, uh, the tribe has little or no authority over. In addition to that, you have the people who want to enter Indian country. And uh, within a few weeks of the Navajo Nation, for example, closing its borders and uh, imposing a curfew because of huge outbreaks, devastating outbreaks in Navajo communities, um, we started to see uh, people just continuing on with their lives, entering Indian country, the Navajo Reservation for tourism purposes, um, objecting and circumventing uh, roadblocks, uh, just doing everything they could to enter Indian country, happened a lot at Navajo, basically happened anywhere where there is a reservation near um, that includes uh, natural uh, parks, uh, you know, that, uh, tourism destinations on or near Indian country. Glacier National Park is right next door to the Blackfeet Reservation. At the eastern side of the Glacier Park in Montana is uh, is, is border, borders the Blackfeet Reservation and people would just come on and insist that they had a right to do so. Um, tribes started putting up roadblocks with an eye towards controlling um, COVID on their reservations and um, really were being very aggressive and active and progressive in, in taking those actions. Um, and you know, non-members were uh, challenging those, those orders and those roadblocks uh, and governments from uh, some governments within the states were backing them up in some ways. Uh, Governor of the state of South Dakota in particular insisted that the tribe had no authority to put up roadblocks. Uh, local governments on and near the Navajo reservation insisted that the tribe had no right to impose a curfew. Luckily, the governor of the state of New Mexico overrode them and assisted the tribe in imposing curfew and roadblocks. Um, overall, you have a lot of major issues. Not even really talked about the problems of um, and many reservations of poverty and extreme vulnerability to disease and illness. Um, the structural racism there goes back to the founding of the United States, if not before. The tribal governments were gutted. Their resources were, were stri stripped from them by the United States and other colonizers. And um, there's just an enormous amount of poverty and uh, lack of health uh, healthcare re resources in Indian country. This is off uh, in the West, it is way, way worse where um, access to water is extremely restricted. At Navajo, people do not have running water in many, part, in many parts of the reservation. And so um, they, they don't wash uh, nearly as much as they needed to during the, the pandemic. And um, they had terrible outbreaks and whole families were simply um, gone within a, the course of a couple of months. And um, 
this has played its way play out and some other reservations in the southwest as well particularly the more rural isolated um, and desert oriented reservations but it's also hit places like mississippi choctaw which is um, a tribe in the state of mississippi um, that is has plenty of water but uh, has still been hit with uh, enormous amounts of um, of infection so that's it in a nutshell i'll turn it over to the next person thank you Thank you. I think we all learned so much just from listening to you in just that very short period of time. I want to return to uh, Professor Mahapatra because what I want to do is I want to give you all an opportunity um, to share the results of your legal research because I know you guys are working very hard on all of these issues um, about or the environment surrounding the legal work that you do and how COVID has impacted outcomes for specific racial groups and what novel legal issues that you've seen that have arisen for these groups as a result of COVID. Um, and just generally speaking, what role do you see technology playing in creating these outcomes? So I know I just asked you a lot. Let me know if you need for me to repeat anything. Uh, sure. Um, and do you want me to answer in five minutes? I'm just gonna put yes, a timer please. on. <laughs> I'm gonna just put a timer on because I, I don't like going over. Um, and so I will maybe answer a little part of that <laughs> at least. Um, and so, you know, in terms of what I have been researching, one of the main things that I've been researching uh, during this time is how um, structural discrimination has impacted three different areas, and that's housing, um, as, as we had you know, housing, employment and healthcare. And we have seen this um, in, you know, we have seen these stark disparities that, you know, people have talked about uh, before, but what has happened with COVID, it's kind of been a perfect storm of sorts because, you know, when we're talking about structural discrimination in housing, some of the environmental risks and that already cause worse health outcomes they are also related to a worse outcome with COVID, right? And so if you have higher rates of cardiovascular disease and respiratory illnesses that we know are linked to substandard housing conditions and we know are linked to food deserts, those are also the same kinds of risk factors that means that you're not gonna do as well if you do contract COVID, right? If you are, according to the CDC, people of color are much more likely to live in densely packed areas and in multi-generational multi housing. And so in crowded living conditions, even if you are able to isolate, even if you are able to, uh, you know, able to stay home is what I mean, um, it's difficult to isolate. Um, it's difficult to not infect other people. Um, when we're talking about structural discrimination in healthcare, we've seen with statistics that in areas that are more segregated, and it's, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't matter what race segregated. And so in a highly African American areas in Chicago, for example, we see the hospitalization rates and death rates of African Americans extremely high, much higher than the percentage of the population. We see this in San Francisco with the Asian American population. We see this in New Mexico uh, with the Native American population. We see, we, we see this in all in New York with Latino population. So we're, we're seeing this in all different kinds of areas. And part of that is because our healthcare system has been gutted historically. In a lot of these segregated areas, there is a lack of public health care option facilities. As a result, there is a lack of physicians that are there. When people come into physicians or health care facilities, often complaints of, you know, whatever complaints of pain, complaints are not are ignored. That's been documented, especially with African Americans. And so we have this kind of healthcare system in the background that has already been hostile to people of color. And it is much less likely if you're Latino, if you're Native American, if you're African American, that you are going to see a healthcare professional that's the same race as you compared to if you're white, if you're Asian. And that also impacts the biases that people have. And so when during COVID, 
all of these things have gotten worse because in, especially in the beginning, we saw that there was a lack of testing facilities. There was a lack of people believing when they went to the ER and she said, you know, I have these symptoms. Well, come back if you can't breathe. Now we know, we know much more about the disease, but we know that it is not merely a respiratory illness. And so the structural discrimination in healthcare played out. For workers, the structural discrimination for workers and people that don't get paid sick leave, that don't have, that are undocumented, that don't have power in their um, workplace, that don't have access to healthcare services, we see that playing out by people not, you know, with meat processing plants, I've been working on research on that, seeing how people are going to work sick because they're, they want to get the bonus because the bonus is the, accountability bonus is actually equivalent to, you know, a few weeks of wages. And also the fear that if they don't go to work, that they are not, you know, that they're not going to have a job. Um, the lack of kind of protections for workers that are not full-time employees. Um, so that's also an an area of structural discrimination. And so I'm almost at five minutes, but so we've been kind of looking at this and seeing what kinds of solutions, kind of describing the problem and then thinking through what kinds of solutions we need to dismantle these structures. Thank you. Um, just to touch on um, a little bit about what you talked about with uh, public health care. In your opinion, why do you think race of infection and hospitalizations and deaths are so disproportionate for minority populations. Is this for me too? Yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. Sorry. I, um, yeah. So, I mean, I the the that's a that's a good question, and you know the the air the disproportionate right rates are not a result of any kind of biological basis uh, that you know someone is naturally more you know susceptible to infection or naturally has a worse course of infection you know that does not exist there is this concept though of weathering where racism itself causes changes in biology and changes in you know stress levels and we've seen this um Arlene Geronimus from Michigan has written a lot of papers on this and talking, talking about how this kind of impacts when you are actually faced with certain diseases or certain um, situations, your outcomes might be worse. But what we see is that it is because of these structural factors that I mentioned, the fact that your environment, your housing environment, your lack of healthcare access, your lack of a safe workplace with protections, that's all making you more likely to get sick when you get sick, more likely, less likely to be able to socially distance and less likely to recover in the same way as someone else. Thank you. As a follow-up, I'm still on you, Professor Mahatra. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. as a follow-up, you talked about housing environment. Can you discuss some examples of structural discrimination in housing environments? Sorry, uh, I wasn't muted. <laughs> I just want to make sure. Yeah, I mean, and so, I mean, I think that some of the issues, you know, that I talked about already would uh, apply. But one thing I didn't talk about is the fact that the relationship between financial health and housing. And so we're seeing this huge eviction crisis in the United States. And a lot of people are not able, because they're not, either they've been furloughed, laid off, um, you know, losing income dur during the pandemic, they're also facing more difficult time paying their rent. And so there's this paying their rent, paying their mortgage. And so there's this huge, huge eviction crisis looming. The CDC, which has been quite politicized during this administration though, has recognized that they issued a federal uh, housing morat uh, eviction moratorium because they recognize that housing is directly related to healthcare. You cannot, you know, in all of these other aspects of social determinants of health, you can, if you do not have a place to stay, we are not like for kids, we are not gonna be able to have successful education, right? We're not going, this is a basic need that we need to make sure of before um, we can think about kind of higher level needs. Thank you. All right. Um, 
Mr. Crossman, I'm going to move on to you. I'm going to ask you the same question and I will restate it because I know it was a mouthful. Okay. Um, can you please describe the results of your legal research or the environment surrounding the legal work that you do um, about how COVID has impacted outcomes for specific racial groups and what novel legal issues have arisen from these groups as a result of COVID? And what role do you foresee technology um, in creating these outcomes? Sure. Um, so I don't really, you know, I, I'm, I'm practicing at legal aid, so I don't have a lot of time to do research necessarily. So this is all about my, my kind of anecdotal um, experience. Um, and what I do is I do a lot of eviction defense in um, city, town, or village courts. So that's the level that I'm working on. Um, as far as some of the things that I've seen, so I've done, I have not had to do a trial or an evidentiary hearing yet. Um, I've been able to do, so I've been able to do remote, I've been able to do in person, uh, you know, all sorts of permutations of those, um, of those arrangements. And I can say that the one, the most difficult situation is having a client and everyone else who is in the courtroom and you're appearing remotely. Um, so we've come to a, I've come to a conclusion that's no good. Um, so <laughs> if the client is going to be there in person, I'm going to be there in person. Um, that brings up the fact that a lot of our clients don't have the technology to appear in person. They could do it out over the phone. Um, but sometimes, and I don't know that this is going to come up yet. Um, but sometimes people have limited numbers of minutes that they can use on their cell phones. Um, so that could potentially be a barrier, um, to how they could call in. Um, I can tell you that the one time that I called in just myself and, and it was only on the phone call, I could hear the sound of the courtroom more than I could hear anyone talking. Um, as you can imagine, the courtrooms are set up for that kind of echo and that kind of projection. So it doesn't come through on the phone very well. Um, I definitely wanted to follow up on the link between housing and health. Um, again, I'm speaking anecdotally, so I'm kind of like the trees, not the forest necessarily. Um, so I can tell you, you know, I did have a client and I can speak about him. Um, this was pre-COVID, but I can speak about him because he is up on our website um, and we've used that, um, you know, as a success story. And he had, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer in March of 2018. So through the summer, we had a, a series of, of housing eviction proceedings with him and we kept him in his housing. We were able to keep him there. Um, so he made it another two years after that, which to me was, you know, it's not research, but to me, there is obviously a link between the fact that he could stay in his house and he survived stage four cancer for another two years after that. Um, and again, uh, the CDC has um, recognized this. Uh, um, some of us as legal practitioners are debating what that actually means, whether it's a moratorium or just a defense, um, because it doesn't seem to be, at least in other areas of the country, it doesn't seem to be that landlords are actually not filing. Um, they might be filing evictions and then that has to be asserted as a defense. Um, one thing I have used, um, I've filed a few things and I have used that CDC um, the, um, the material to basically, it basically says, you know, how important it is to be able to remain in your home, how important it is to be able to isolate, how important these things are. So that's, that's one of the most useful things I found is to kind of crib that, crib some of those, um, statements into a paragraph to kind of help, um, give a little more, oomph to the argument. Um, I don't personally, you know, I've been doing this for three years. I don't think it should need more, but um, it does seem a little more stark when you say my client is homeless and is, is staying at the city mission and he has, is potentially, you know, exposed or exposing other people. And, you know, that should potentially give it a little more urgency, hopefully. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Uh, as far as unique issues, um, one thing that in the early days and now, even even now, one thing that came up was access to apartments. Um, you know, obviously tenants sometimes are understandably um, cautious about who they want to let in. Um, landlords generally have a right to reasonable access. What's reasonable in a pandemic is probably different than what's reasonable not in a pandemic. Would be my argument, though. Um, so that's one of the challenges. The other thing that I noted in the keynote speaker. Um, Black female headed households are um, most of my clients. And I noted that she said that that's the, the, the um, 
group that has lost the most income or most susceptible to income loss right now. So um, we also try to look at the short term and at the long term and long term, that is gonna be a problem. Thank you. Um, and, and speaking about the problems, the loss of incomes, the importance of keeping people in their homes, but also the challenges that many people face with virtual courts. Um, in, in your experience, and even speaking anecdotally, have you had experience with courts that have developed any sort of remedies to help people who have um, troubles accessing virtual courts? Uh, unfortunately, I haven't. Um, keep in mind that uh, the courts have really only been moving forward the last couple months, really, on evictions. Um, and there's still some, you know, question about which which eviction cases they can move forward on. Um, I I can say that when I've been there in person, I have been um, somewhat heartened by the um, precautions that I've seen in place. Um, I, and I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen um, as far as our clients potentially going in in person. Um, I was at a hearing in the summer where um, someone from the courts said, you know, the court administrator or someone said, hey, you know, this is not a place or a time to be, be bringing children into court. And I have to say, I, I, I don't disagree with that. However, my clients who are facing a non-payment eviction can't afford childcare. So where does that leave us? Thank you. Um, I want to move on to Professor Fletcher. I want you to answer the same question and I'll re restate it. Can you describe the results of your legal research or the environment surrounding the legal work that you are currently doing um, and how COVID has impacted outcomes for specific racial groups? What novel legal issues have arisen for these groups as a result of COVID? And what role do you think technology plays in creating these outcomes? Thank you. So, um, you know, there, there have been a, a lot of impacts. And one of the things that I think I'd like to address, um, in part because it, it's not really completely responsive to your question, and I'm sorry for that, but I think okay. it's useful to talk <laughs> about the impact of the pandemic on law teaching. And um, we have a, a relatively small number of Native students in law schools around the country. And I think that their experiences translate to a lot of other poor and underprivileged minority groups. Um, and uh, so what, we, what we're seeing with a lot of our Native students is that they come, we, I'm at Michigan State, they come from all over the country. Um, there's really only a, a hundred or so, maybe a bit more of that uh, in a given year of native people that matriculate to law schools. And so our numbers are incredibly small to begin with. Um, some of the law schools, I would say a half or maybe even two thirds of the, all of the students, um, native students who go to law school in a given year are probably only at about four or five different schools around the country. And um, uh, I include Michigan State in that. We have upwards of uh, 25 or 30 Native students um, in our in our cohort in the three years of law school at any given time, our students are incredibly isolated. Um, many of them um, went back to their, to Indian country uh, during the beginning of the pandemic in, in March. Um, Indian country is notorious for not having uh, adequate broadband. I mentioned water before, but um, the the internet uh, opportunities for uh, the availability for our students is incredibly low. Many of them, if they wanted to come back to law school, we wanted them to obviously for the fall, had to come to Michigan. Uh, they had to leave their homes and come to Michigan and basically quarantine here, away from their families, away from um, their support networks. Uh, we have a support network here of people, uh, faculty and staff and other students, uh, as well as other groups on campus that uh, we've cultivated for the past 15 years to try to help our students uh, pass law school. And they, we can't access that now either. They're, everybody is quarantined, nobody's in the building, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's been a really rough and rough struggle for many of our students. And um, uh, I wanted to highlight that as just a microcosm for really what goes on in Indian country more generally. Um, we, we are seeing uh, efforts to try to extend the broadband network to Indian country, but um, it's hit and miss and a lot of places in Indian country and I keep bringing up Navajo, but it's true in basically any rural area. Um, there, is, there is no opportunity to go on a, a call like this. There's no Zoom. 
if you're in Alaska, there's no internet at all. Um, everything is conducted by the by a simple telephone, which is great that there are phones, and that's relatively new. Um, but there is no internet to speak of, or at least not in a way that's strong enough to actually do conduct a meeting like the one we're having right now. Certainly not a class. Um, a lot of our, by the way, just as an aside, a lot of our students are also from the West. So uh, we have students who have three classes that take place at eight or 8.30 in the morning and they're, they're in Pacific time. So they're taking classes at five o'clock in the morning. And I mean, that's not unique to um, native people or pe even people of color, but uh, it's this, all of this is just incredibly difficult. So um, I don't know if I've spoken for five minutes, but I, I did wanna I talk a little bit more about some of the impacts in Indian country are uh, one of the tragedies, frankly, of, of this whole pandemic is that um, what happens when there is a crisis anywhere in Indian country, whether it's uh, just a family crisis, a local crisis, regional, national crisis, whatever it is, Indian people come together and our, we are communities that depend heavily on um, our social networks. And that has created ungodly tragedies throughout Indian country and bits and places. Whenever we hear in Michigan, hear of an outbreak on, on, a, on or near a reservation, it's almost always associated with a wedding or a funeral. Um, the funerals bl bleed into additional funerals. And um, you know the, the numbers are not particularly huge here in Michigan. We've been really lucky with that in that way, but I can imagine that on large reservations with lots of native people that it's far worse. Our, our reservations are pretty small here, relatively speaking. So I'll leave it at that. Sorry if I was not totally responsive, but I thought those were important things to say. No, those are exceptionally important points, exceptionally important points to make. So I appreciate your response. Um, and I, I want to touch on the landmark Supreme Court decision, uh, McGirt v. Oklahoma, um, where there was a significant portion of eastern Oklahoma as an Indian reservation, which belongs to the Muscogee. Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Seminole nations. And I wanted you to discuss, um, has, has this decision impacted the way these nations are able to enforce COVID restrictions? And has it helped these tribes to better manage and stop the spread of COVID? Um, no, I don't, I don't think it would have any impact at all. And uh, those, those are criminal jurisdiction cases uh, about Indian people. And um, so on those reservations, the vast majority of the population are, are not tribal members, they're not Indians. And as I said before, there's really no impact on those individuals. The main impact uh, of those cases, if they do impact non-members has to do with you know, oil and gas regulation and that sort of thing. So there, there's a lot of um, action on that front. Uh, but I think what's related to the McGirt case, it really stands for a much broader proposition. Um, one of the few times that, that the Supreme Court has actually just applied the law. Um, almost all the time that Native people or Indian tribes go to the Supreme Court, the law is on our side. Um, and it's usually what happens is if you have five votes at the Supreme Court, you can change the law if you have to, or distinguish cases that otherwise would have been, um, that would have governed an outcome. So. It, this was a hard case because the facts on the ground, the optics of the case for, for, for tribal interests were really quite terrible. And uh, in a narrow five to four majority, the court said, hey, you know, that, that all these stories about the impacts are just that. Um, we, we're here to apply the law. And they applied the law as they have been saying that the law is for a half century or more on this particular question. And if there are impacts, you can go to Congress and get those fixed. And so that, that was a good sign in terms of going forward, what hopefully the court will do. Um, you know, when somebody asks me what the impact of another judge will be, when you lose one of the members of, of a five to four majority, I just say, go Google a mushroom cloud online and you'll get your outcome. Uh, but I did wanna add a, another thing that's uh, really important that's going at, that has been going on for the past half century in Indian country is tribes really do have um, in an era of self-determination do have some political clout. And um, the, the CARES Act in particular, the tr multi-trillion dollar um, uh, relief package had $8 billion set aside uh, for, for Indian country. And um, given that the annual expenditure for the United States in Indian affairs is about a third of that, 
uh, really could have been a really uh, sh a shocking injection of relief into Indian country. Um, the fact that tribes are able to reach out to their congressional delegations, that there are people, a few people, uh, I, I guess it'll be up to six after this election, Native people in, as members of Congress makes a bit of a difference. Um, there, there's still a, a huge issue on how the $8 billion is going to be distributed, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the fact that it actually happened is really quite remarkable. And um, the, the, the ongoing underfunding of Indian country, Indian affairs, um, Indian healthcare, Indian law enforcement is a, it's an ongoing situation of structural racism that is not gonna be solved for, with a big cash payment, but um, it was helpful and it shows where there are places where tribes can work with, you know, the the trustee, the United States, the, the protector, so to speak, and uh, that was really quite encouraging, um, and I hope that it can be continued going forward. Thank you. Um, and now I want to move on to our next round of questions. Um, if we could shorten our responses, you guys have been fine, but I want to make sure that we have time for our audience questions. So if you could shorten your responses to about two or three minutes for the next um, question that I ask you all. Um, I'll begin with uh, Professor Mohapatra. Since COVID-19 has emerged from China, there has been a rise in xenophobia and anti-Asian sentiment. How can the law and policy play a greater role in combating this? All right, yeah, um, that's, that's absolutely true. So in two to three, three minutes, I'll just um, say that one of the things that we've learned in past pandemics is that this kind of xenophobia is common. We saw this in SARS, we saw this in H1N1. And one of the things that we haven't seen in this pandemic is the federal response to that. And so in September, the House of Representatives had a, passed a resolution uh, kind of speaking out against the anti-Asian sentiment and you know calling COVID-19 Kung Flu or the China virus or Wuhan virus. Um, and even that was not bipartisan. I mean, that there were a lot of Republican Congress people that still voted against that resolution, even though it didn't have any kind of teeth to it. But what we've seen in past administrations, Republican and Democratic uh, administrations, is we've seen the Justice Department speak out against incidents of hate. We've seen the CDC actually document and bring out community groups into the communities that are impacted. We saw that with SARS and H1N1. We have not seen that with COVID-19. And so we really need to make sure that the communities that are impacted feel supported. We need to have from the top a denouncement of this kind of uh, violence instead of actually stoking these uh, xenophobic fears up there. Thank you. That was really good, two to three minutes. All right, Mr. Crossman, what lessons have you taken away from practicing law during the pandemic and serving communities of color, especially since we have also been confronted with the reckoning of racial justice as a result of the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and so many others? So um, oh, in two to three minutes, yes. uh, <laughs> I would say, um, you know, one thing that occurs to me is, and not to downplay any of this, but there's not a lot of attention being played on the civil end of things and the housing. And it just kind of, what's the through line of all the names you mentioned, they are all deceased. And why do we have to get to a place where people are dying in order to address these issues? Um, so I, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here on that, but that that's what occurred to me this morning is thinking of, you know, the impact of that. Um, you know, there, these structural issues, they're, they're pervasive. They're not, I think everyone thinks that there's some kind of smoking gun or there's some one incident or one thing that happened um, that you can, you can, you can, you know, hang your hat on and, and bring that into court. Um, as far as legal services providers, that takes a lot more resources to prove something that's uh, systemic discrimination, a pattern, um, obviously. And in housing, obviously, we we have a little more time now since the legislature passed a, a new law last year in 2019, but housing cases go very quickly. Um, so there's not a lot of time to, to gather a lot of evidence um, necessarily. Um, the one thing I will say is, um, 
it's person it, it's pretty exhausting work to do um and i can only imagine what how exhausting and frustrating it is to live through um so i am very aware of the fact that um I, this is my job and I do have the privilege of finding another job if I if I get totally burnt out and my clients do not have that option. Thank you. Professor Fletcher, in terms of the pandemic, uh, what is the most press, pressing issue that tribes are facing in responding to COVID? Uh, what are some other issues that have presented themselves that may not have been so prevalent prior to the pandemic? Well, <clears throat> I think what we're seeing is that um, uh, healthcare in Indian country has uh, improved to some extent. Uh, tribes have been able to often, but not always, take over control over um, their own healthcare facilities and their own healthcare administration. Uh, but there st still remains chronic underfunding. And this is not just a, um, this is not merely a political issue. It is a legal issue. Um, for many years, well over a century now, the United States, primarily through the Department of Justice, has uh, litigated and uh, mostly prevailed on the question of the trust responsibility as being primarily or mostly voluntary on behalf of the United States. So think of um, a given Indian reservation as um, a parcel of land that was set aside for a tribe, but really the tribe uh, turned over or sold um, a much larger swath of land with all of the uh, concomitant resources that were attached to that. And in exchange for that, the United States did set aside some land for reservation purposes and may have provided a cash payments or something. But more importantly, took the tribe under uh, uh, its duty of protection. The United States has an obligation to, uh, like any other superior or larger sovereign over a smaller sovereign, to protect um, and provide for that sovereign. They've guaranteed their, they've, their they promise to guarantee law enforcement, uh, you know, law and order, health, food, resources, everything. And, um, you know, the chronic underfunding is just a failure of that obligation. We're starting to see cases um, that I've participated in in some contexts um, that are suggesting that the Department of Justice all along was wrong on the duty of protection. It's not a voluntary obligation, which is a contradiction in terms. It's a, a real duty and an obligation that should be legally enforceable. Ironically, Congress says this all the time. Every time it passes an act uh, in Indian Affairs, it says we reaffirm the trust responsibility and that it is an enforceable one. It's merely the Department of Justice and the Supreme Court that have articulated and adopted a theory that the trust responsibility is merely a moral obligation that cannot be forced upon uh, the United States. And we think that's false. Um, and I think the pandemic is a moment where there's going to be an enormous amount of legal disruption. And McGirt came out uh, at the beginning, uh, at the height of the pandemic. And we, we think that there is uh, an opportunity to make some changes and to project, uh, propose some arguments to the court, to the judiciary that might be able to disrupt the perceptions that you know, many, many agencies in the United States, uh, branches of government in the United States have in relation to any Thank you. Um, I want to check with the audience. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? If so, please put it in the chat box. Okay. In that case, I still have one more question for you all. <laughs> all right. So we have about six minutes left and I want each of you to answer this question and I'll begin with you, Professor Mahapatra. Generally, what are some short-term solutions to address the racial disparities that you have discussed? Um, and also what are some long-term solutions and how do you see the legal field adapting to address these challenges? I'm just so you laughing. got a three for. <laughs> I, I'm laughing at two minutes for that, but um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just highlight a couple of things. So, you know, one of the things that we need to do in terms of our healthcare system is to make sure that we gain the trust of communities of color because, you know, uh, the the healthcare system has a history and a well-deserved 
uh, kind of lack of trustworthiness. Um, and so we need to engage communities of color um, and you know, minority led organizations, minority groups about how to develop fair allocation policies for testing, for PPE, for ventilators, for clinical trial enrollment, for vaccine delivery, um, you know, treatment and vaccine access. And so, you know, we've seen that uh, communities of color have borne the brunt of the pandemic. And so they should actually be involved in making sure that their communities get the access to the care uh, and treatments that they need. And this, this will, I think, go far in rebuilding trust and understanding. Um, one of the things that you, know, you had asked about technology before, and I didn't really address it, but we can't rely on technology as a uh, kind of replacement for this care and this um, you, obligation that we have for each other. And so we've seen this with like contact tracing apps. We've seen lots of methods of trying to get technology to replace something that should be a function of public health. And we really can't do that. And I think long-term, we need to think about the root causes of these problems, you know, financial support, paid sick leave, comprehensive health care that's not tied to your employment, making sure you cover people that are undocumented in healthcare services, making sure that, that we have a universal basis basic income that is not related to, that doesn't mean that we're going to gut our other public programs. Um, so those are some of the long-term solutions I see. Thank you. Mr. Frostman, same question. Would you like for me to repeat it? Oh, no, that's okay. I can, we can okay. say it. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, I think the- Solve everything. <laughs> I will, in 90 seconds. <laughs> um, so I think, in the short term, I think the obvious answer would be rent forgiveness. I don't know that that's the correct answer, to be honest with you. Um, what I'm seeing now as, as things are getting colder, you know, it's a lot easier for a landlord to turn the heat off and um, call code enforcement and say, hey, there's no heat. They're living in a place with no heat. Um, and absent any, you know, um, involvement from municipality, a lot of my clients would prefer to stay in a client in a, an apartment with no heat uh, than go into a shelter, um, which is pretty sad. Um, so I think that one thing, if there is going to be rent forgiveness, I think that there are there should be you know an effort to make both parties whole. Um, I, I'm saying that because I think that that um, we're seeing rising tensions as this goes further and further between landlords and tenants. Let's, not, uh, let's also not forget that there, are, um, there are, are landlords who are minorities as well, um, people of color. Um, so I think that's kind of the short term. In the long term, I think we really honestly need to rethink um, evictions and how they, how they are operating. Um, it was just this summer I was in a, in a meeting and someone really, brought, you know, I've been doing this job for but three, three and a half years. And I never occurred to me that this is a zero tolerance debt, right? We don't have any tolerance. So if you, if you're one month behind on your rent, you can lose your home and why, and we have other methods for other debts that can, that, um, you know, are not quite as, um, dire. Um, so I think, you know, we, ne we never really tie it to the home. And that's really, literally what we're saying is, um, you know, there's, you're, <laughs> sorry, I'm rambling. <laughs> I'm trying to solve all the problems right now. But basically, I'm just saying that um, evictions, the way we think of them right now, um, might need to be rethought. Um, you know, the, I don't even want to go into the whole property law rethinking either, but that might be something we need to rethink too. <laughs> Thank you. And Professor Fletcher, would you like to close this out? Sure. I've had more time to think about it than the others. So <laughs> a couple of short term things. Um, what we're seeing is a, a, a disparity with um, how tribes are treated in different states. Um, so here in Michigan, not to uh, toot my, uh, my lovely wife's horn, but my wife has been the tribal affairs attorney for the governor for the past two years. And um, has worked closely with the tribes. And, uh, you know, when the tribes have an outbreak, uh, state public health uh, officials are ready and um, willing to cooperate and do everything they can to help the tribes. This isn't always the case in a lot of states. Um, some states just don't talk to tribes. They don't think of tribes as real things. Um, Indian people don't vote for them, so they don't 
uh, public officials tend to ignore them, um, even discriminate against them openly. So um, on a short term, uh, the big the short term thing would just to be to require uh, local, state and the federal government. The CDC is a good example of so just to talk to tribes and treat them as if they are part of the system of cooperative federalism that uh, governs this entire country. And that's the, really the bigger picture, I think, is a long term effort to make sure that tribes that are federally acknowledged, there's 574 of them, are treated as if they are um, truly sovereigns and part of the larger structure of cooperative federalism. And like I said, I think over the past half century, we're moving in that direction. The United States uh, Congress in particular has been strongly supportive of tribal self-determination and acknowledging at least some tribal powers, but um, it's, it's only, uh, we're, we're still working in toward a goal. And, um, you know, that, that's, uh, that's, I think, a, a longer term issue and, um, that, that I, I would strongly work, work towards. I always have. Thanks. Thank you. We've now reached the end of our panel discussion. So I would like to thank our amazing panelists. And I will now turn it over to Simone. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, all the panelists, for joining us, all the attendees. Um, it has been an incredibly insightful panel. Um, thank you for joining us. The session is going is recorded. Um, it will be available uh, online on many of our um, on many of our social media platforms. So, um, if you if anyone knows anyone who wanted to join and didn't get a chance, you'll be able to view it uh, later. Thank you, everyone, um, and good luck with everything. Uh, have a great day. Thanks so much. I think Thank Professor you. Fletcher has a question about his background, so <laughs> I'm curious now, too. Yeah, it's a painting by um, a man named Norval Morriso from Ontario is Anishinaabe. It's, these are water spirits. It's hard to see. Uh -huh. They're fish, and um, there's a couple of fish in there, a lot of fish. And I think the, the yellow one in the middle may be a beaver. No, I don't know what it is. Might be the panther, the underwater panther, Nishibishu, that's what it is, sorry. Water creatures. Thank you.